The Adventures of Mark Twain isn't the actual title of the memoir by the author of The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn. Still, the story of how this book is finally coming to be published is a bit of an adventure tale all its own. Jeff Glow has it for us, chapter and verse. It's been 100 years since Mark Twain died. After declaring, if I cannot swear in heaven, I shall not stay there. Well, wherever he is a century later, the words and stories he left behind live on. On stage... Oh, I used to tell lies. <laughs> but I've given it up. The field is overrun with amateurs. <laughs> in movies... It felt good getting back in the river. Other places feel so cramped and smothered. But the river don't. And of course, in books. The most famous of which, The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn, still captivates readers around the world. They always played hooky, and they went on rash down the Mississippi. I would like to do that one day. Not play hooky, but go on a raft. Now, all these years later, there's a new book by Mark Twain, his autobiography about to be published as he specifically instructed 100 years after his death. We have some real treasures here. Yes. Robert Hurst is curator of the Mark Twain Papers at UC Berkeley, where a small army of editors has been laboring for six years to reconstruct the autobiography just as Twain wished it to be. This is now the end of a very long process for you all. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. Can you believe it's here? Uh, actually, we can't. <laughs> There are two other jokes coming, just so you know. Comedian Louis Black, who considers himself and all modern humorists to be descendants of Twain, can't believe it either. His book is uh, coming out and uh, just around the time the mine is. And, and, and you kind of go, Twain, Louis Black, Twain, Louis Black, there's really, <laughs> given the choice, I'm going to buy the Mark Twain book. <laughs> I'm sure my publisher will be thrilled to hear that. I, and the question I think a lot of people ask is, 100 years later, why now? Nobody can be hurt. Mark Twain had a very tender heart. He liked to say nasty things. He was really good at it. But he didn't like the idea of uh, being there when the person heard them <laughs> and, and was hurt by them. That's one aspect of the 100-year embargo. The other is just freeing him up to say exactly what he wanted. So it's, in a way, he, he doesn't have him looking over his shoulder. Anyone who was looking over his shoulder may have thought the old man had lost it. The autobiography is highly unconventional, in many ways ultra-modern, not telling one straight story from birth until death, but skipping around. Mark Twain wants this autobiography to be random. He, you know, he's going to talk about what he wants to talk about on this day, change his mind, and move on to the next thing. You heard that right, talk. One of the greatest writers in American history decided the best way to tell his own story was not to write it, but speak it. Daily dictations over four years about whatever he found interesting that day. Was Mark Twain the first blogger? I've said that. I mean, I've, I've, I would say that that is exactly right. I mean, after all, this autobiography is, as he says, partly a journal, partly a diary, and partly recollection. So, yeah, I think of it as, as a kind of blog, a blog without... A web. In Twain's words, and there are roughly 650,000 of them in what will be three volumes, President Theodore Roosevelt is one of the most impulsive men in existence. The American soldiers Roosevelt sent to the Philippines, Twain called uniformed assassins. And then there's his Italian landlady, who's excitable, malicious, malignant, vengeful, unforgiving, selfish, stingy, avaricious, coarse, vulgar, profane, and obscene, and that's just for starters. There are funny, fond stories of his family and his raw, stunned heartbreak at his daughter Susie's sudden death. But if you're expecting a tabloid tell-all, Twain admits he failed at that. In fact, in, I think in the third month of dictation, he says, I've, you know, I've thought of uh, a thousand shameful things that I've done in my life, and I've not gotten one of them to go on paper yet. When Twain began dictating, the man famous worldwide for his white suit, 
his best-selling novels, and his rip-roaring lectures was, in his own words, the most conspicuous person on the planet, the first global superstar. You think the trip to Australia was a defining moment for him? I think it was. The, trip to the humorist had a serious side as well. Anger at the atrocities he witnessed as he traveled the world, which he put into words and had illustrated, now on display at the Morgan Library in New York City. Isaac Gewertz is one of the curators of the exhibition. This uh, refers to uh, an actual event that happened in South Africa. In Following the Equator, published in 1897, Twain tells the story of a South African farmer's treatment of the native population. He invited uh, a group of natives to his uh, farm for a Christmas dinner, uh, told them that the plum pudding he was serving was a traditional dish when they worshiped their lord, and then he laced it with arsenic, and they died a horrible death. Despite his outrage at human cruelty, Twain often censored his published work, not wanting to alienate his audience or jeopardize his family's livelihood. There's certain things in this book that if I were to read them now on CBS, people would be flipping out. It's a it's hundred years ago. Which may help explain why, when Twain decided to write a no-holds-barred autobiography... People close to him were, of course, terrified, I think, that he was holding forth, letting loose all his innermost feelings about his family and friends. Curator Declan Kiley. And uh, he actually felt it necessary to reassure his daughter that I won't bury you alive. The 100-year embargo, says Robert Hurst, was also an extraordinary publicity ploy. The story behind a hundred year wait for an autobiography. All you have to do is look at the last three months of the web and the newspapers to see that he was right. He knew how to market it. Just say it can't be read for a hundred years. That'll do it. Well, that's the thing of publishing it a hundred years later and saying you're going to say all of these things. Oh, here it comes, here comes the dirt. Ha, 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 ha. He's good. You gotta love him. It's one of the most brilliant marketing schemes outside of Facebook. So, whether he opted for the climate of heaven, the company in hell, or some other spot, one thing is certain. 100 years after his death, Mark Twain is still very much here.